Hopefully we are live. Hello, and a very warm welcome to the sixth live session of Voyages into the Past, Uthit Prabha. Today's topic is Neoliberal Neighborhoods, Populism and Politics in India. Today, we are very fortunate to have amongst us Dr. Rajoshi Dasgup. Dr. Dasgup is an associate professor at the Center for Political Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Though Dr. Dasgup needs no formal introduction, but for the sake of courtesy, he say that his works are widely acknowledged across academia. His works have a very spectrum ranging from urban studies, the history of leftist movement in Bengal, to his most recent forthcoming work on the intellectual history of Marxism. Dr. Dasgupta teaches a various number of courses, ranging from political economy on one hand, to Marxist philosophy, and post-structural thought on the other. So without any further away, over to you, sir. A very warm welcome to you on behalf of Voyages into the Past, Odit Prabha. Thank you, Odit. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, OK. Thank you for those very kind words of introduction. Um, this is a somewhat experimental work in progress kind of uh, paper based on which I'm going to give this lecture. And it's um, possibly slightly lengthier than what one would expect in, a, in an online talk. But nevertheless, um, let me venture and see how it goes down with all of you. Thank you all very much for coming in today and uh, joining this. And um, I look forward to your feedback and comments uh, for enriching uh, the paper, which is in the making. Now, let me just um, explain how I have structured the presentation. Um, I'm going to begin with what I might describe as my unhappiness about um, the studies on populism. And there is now quite a rich body of literature which is growing every day on populism and populist politics across the world as well as in India. Some absolutely remarkable um, contributions and uh, engagements have come in in recent times. The latest is, uh, of course, from the well-known historian and theorist Partha Chatterjee. And um, there, I must also mention a very, very interesting work by a colleague of mine, Dr. Ajay Gudavarti, on right-wing populism. Now, my unhappiness with uh, most of these studies is that they produce uh, various kinds of insights and there is a lack of um, speaking to each other or interconnectedness of these insights and I'm going to begin with that. I'm going to then go on to talk about what looking at urbanization and urban governance can tell us about populism and the questions that it helps to pose with regard to how populism works on the ground. I'm going to then explain what I mean by neoliberal neighborhoods, which is there in the title. Um, I'll give some examples as well. I'm going to briefly explain thereafter the political economy of these neighborhoods, how they function. And then I'm going to go into the meat of uh, the substance of this paper, which is about the aesthetic fashioning of these neighborhoods, especially the kind of beautification that they involve and the what I am sort of bringing to the table, which is the kind of political messaging that is at work in this aesthetic fashioning and beautification. I'm going to then briefly talk about some troubling aspects, two of them certainly. And this is going to be the sort of first, one might say theoretical half of the lecture. And then I'm going to go into the case studies, uh, which will dwell upon the historical background of two case studies, I'm going to draw upon liberally uh, on a very, very young, remarkable scholar's work and mm, 
I'm going to present a case study of my own uh, in some length, and then I'm going to wrap up uh, by way of conclusion, make some general remarks, and then I'll seek your uh, reactions and your comments and so on. So without further ado, let me begin with the paper. So to begin with, as I promised, my unhappiness with uh, the studies on populism till date. Now, simply understood what these studies basically hand us is that one can see that there are two major trajectories in populist politics. One of these trajectories involves creating the chain of equivalence between differential claims and demands of disparate groups, uh, as we know famously uh, has been put forth by Ernest Laclau. And this is then followed by the delivery of targeted benefits among the population after taking over power. The other trajectory involves the phenomena of an individual leader who is supreme because populism, as theorists like Cass Mudd tells us, is ideologically extremely thin. So there is this phenomenon of an individual supreme leader who can bypass the institutions, the bureaucracy, everything in between, and directly can reach out to the masses. These masses are in turn staged as the authentic people, the people, so to speak, and it is them as the people that is pitted against another section that is seen as the elite and the enemy of the people. So these are the two major trajectories and they form the narrative of populist politics, one could say, in a nutshell. What is not always clear in this narrative, and this is what makes me uncomfortable and unhappy, is where and exactly how these different trajectories overlap and intersect in practice, on the ground. We cannot follow, for example, how does the leader's delivery of benefits can produce a loyal support base, when there are also other leaders as well as other parties offering similar packages, promising similar benefits, and why is this any different from, let us say, the older framework of clientelist politics? Again, there are some recent analyses, uh, like that of uh, Ajay Guravarti, which correctly underscore a psychological dimension uh, that is crucial for understanding how the support for populist leaders can do away with rational deliberations and become sort of like a blind devotion, uh, which is akin to a religious cult in some sense. Then again, there are certain studies which very, very insightfully point out a nexus between such politics and petty businessmen and crony capitalism, on the other hand. But there is no explanation of how this nexus, let us say, is connected to the dimension of psychological manipulation. In other words, there are these various kinds of insights and trajectories which do not connect in a network, which do not intersect with each other. An important consequence of this lack of connections between the various features and aspects of populism is that it becomes difficult to distinguish populist politics from what is not populist politics, but let's say simply electoral politics or clientelist politics. Having a charismatic leader. More importantly, we keep wondering what is it that is really specific to populism today? And how it is changing what we call politics, what we know as politics. Despite the rich scholarship on populism, much of it, I must say, resembles what we know as electoral politics in this country since independence. So the question is, how do we capture those aspects which are new 
and are transforming politics in ways that are unprecedented, that we have never witnessed before. This is the big question that I have in mind for this lecture, which takes up a specific case of populist governance with regard to urban development and tries to address this problematic of what is specific and how we can connect the different trajectories and uh, observations made in the studies on populism. So then what are the questions that one can pose by looking at urban governance? Urban development and the transformation of cityscapes is an important strategy of contemporary populist politics and governance. It often involves the beautification and creation of new leisure spaces apart from new housing projects, gated communities, and places of recreation like shopping malls. However, as noted above, it is again not always clear how such changes are qualitatively different from those that were wrought in the past. Indeed, what makes it all of a sudden populist? Does it throw up new types of space, new modes of experience that are specific and important for populist political mobilizations? Can we observe new kinds of public goods and services that generate a sense of well-being among targeted population groups? How does it translate into economic logic when we know growth is slowing down, jobs are downsized, and the budgets for such projects are getting increasingly tighter by the day? Where does it figure in the actual scheme of populist politics done on the ground, which involves a wide range of symbolic and affective registers and the capacity to create and manipulate social coalitions? How does it bear upon the decision-making process exercised by ordinary people and their political behavior? Does it lead to a democratic Paradox, in some sense, where the inclusion of more people, which is democratic, can also coincide with increasing support for authoritarianism, which is anti-democratic. It is important to flag these questions today, even if we cannot answer them with sufficient clarity in today's lecture. So let me explain what I mean by neoliberal neighborhoods. Let me try and address these questions, drawing upon two case studies that are chosen from the localities that are emerging as minor recreational hubs on the eastern fringe of Kolkata. These sites are Lake Town, Srivumi, located on the VIP road in the north of eastern metropolitan bypass, and Patuli, in the south of the same highway which is taking urbanization farther south to localities like Kamalgaji that used to be farmlands even a few years back. The larger idea here is to look at these neighborhoods as illustrations of a key strategy of populist governance. And what is this strategy? It is the creation of neoliberal neighborhoods in this country. How are these distinct as neighborhoods? How are they different, in other words, from neighborhoods of the past? <coughs> Excuse me. So these neighborhoods are not just newly built, showcasing the latest arterial roads, housing projects, shopping malls and gated communities, replacing lanes and alleyways replacing smaller buildings and parks with familiar pockets of people. These neighborhoods are in fact deliberately designed to do something, to display what we can understand as a synthetic and fabricated hyper-reality that is perennially festive and cheery, that creates the illusion of older posh 
localities of the city. Sometimes with a theme park look, hosting musical soirees, frequent fairs, prettified pavements with pastiche statuary, fiberglass replicas of film stars and icons, famous landmarks, cartoon figures, logos, tableau and mini spectacles that dot the landscape for public consumption. A wide variety of people are found to be frequenting these neighborhoods. Some even travel from far off localities to enjoy the feel of these sites, strolling, taking selfies in front of the lit up showpieces, sitting by the water, shooting short, sometimes TikTok videos to share on social media, snacking, taking part in the petty consumption on the offer. Apart from couples and families, many are young people from the middle and lower middle classes, cutting across religion, gender and caste, who feel happy to be in these spaces that include them in the urban experience at an affordable cost. The local neighborhood clubs have been made into active partners in the transformation of these spaces which has led to a more open and different mode of socialization in the area than what used to take place when the same clubs would periodically organize events in the past in smaller scales. Now, unlike those occasions, the number of local inhabitants may not be very high among the people who gather outdoors, say on a weekend evening, and the clubs do not necessarily control the activities in such publics, which are encouraged and patronized often by the local councillor, the MLA, with of course the endorsement of the chief minister. These are neighborhoods that literally showcase urban development in the regime of Mamata Banerjee, a prominent example of a regional populist leader like the late Jai Lalita in Tamil Nadu, Mayawati in UP, Modi, formerly in Gujarat before he became Prime Minister, Kejriwal in Delhi, and increasingly Yogi Adityanath in UP. And I believe these neoliberal neighborhoods are not unique to Mamata's style of populist governance. They resonate and speak more widely to recent models of urban development with telling parallels in cities like Royagraj. Wait a moment. I'll just try to show you uh, some slides uh, that to go along with um, so just bear with me for a moment. There we are. I think you're being able to look at my screen. I believe you're looking at uh, Bahadur Ganj Prayagraj at this moment. Um, somebody should let me know if, if the slide sharing is not working. Uh, so here uh, you are looking at Proyagraj, which is undergoing, as you can see, a visual transformation, even as we speak in Ahmedabad. Uh, and, 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 and the similar phenomena can be uh, found in the example of Sabarmati waterfront in Ahmedabad, as well as elsewhere in the global south, including countries in Latin America, and they provide a valuable basis. These neighborhoods provide an important basis to the respective regime's political legitimacy. So let me come back.
Okay. Let me briefly explain the political economy of uh, creating these neighborhoods. So the economic process of creating these neighborhoods involves developing what economists would describe as certain focal points along the urban pet. These should be preferably located next to an infrastructure corridor or highway, where the land use pattern is extremely volatile and changing. The farmlands can then undergo rapid acetization, the water bodies can be filled up, and the landscape repurposed fast to change its character. Once this process takes off, and I'm not going into the detail, we can come back to this in the question answer session if you like. But once this process begins, you find migrant labor and young professionals moving in to these areas and taking up residences on cheap rent. Entering the informal sector and what are described as gig economies in the area and beginning to travel across the inner city. When the state wants to attract investment to these focal points they are developing, it looks to facilitate retail consumption by organizing formerly decentralized and petty private players in the vicinity. This then works as a trigger of urbanization. Instead of extending the municipal infrastructure and delivery of public goods to the local population, which is how cities used to expand in the past. It is crucial to note how the idea of governance as the state's delivery of services to its population groups is undergoing a strategic switchover in this process. What we are looking at is a stealthy shift to a new smart model of urban governance, where the responsibility for development is being passed on to private players and retail consumption. This move is providing the political leadership with new ways to diversify both the risk and the cost to the exchequer involved in delivering governance. This is then how the process fits in with the slowing growth rate and budget cuts, where the regime is creating a way around the financial and infrastructural constraints to deliver urbanization. As we can see from the policies at large, this logic holds good for many aspects beyond urban governance. However, the bulk of this paper is not really about the economics of these neoliberal neighborhoods. Let me draw your attention to what I am going to treat as the central dimension in this lecture, which is involving beautification and the aesthetic fashioning of these neighborhoods, which are precisely designed to provide a platform for the political messaging of the ruling party. As the case studies will show, this messaging takes place in three different ways, and this is how we can theorize, which lead to one strategic outcome. The first way involves the very nature and function of beautification, which is very, very different from the earlier facelifts of Indian cities that basically looked at poor people as a source of nuisance and ugliness in the cityscape, like what happened to Delhi during the Asian Games, about which scholars like Gartner have written uh, at length. These drives, the ones in the past, used to clear up squatter settlement and gentrify localities, making the localities exclusive and what we can describe as classy. The new kind of beautification is very different and stands in sharp contrast. It involves a different idea of beauty that 
the cultivated classy people may find cheap, tacky, and even repulsive. Instead, it makes up an aesthetic experience that caters to the masses who care less for a sense of distinction in their consumption choice. Thus, this aesthetic fashioning plays with a sense of simulation and culture of copies and replicas, evident in the statuary and showpieces in the different sites. Think of Big Ben in Sri Bhumi. I can show you the slide later on. Now, these replicas and copies refer to the authentic and makes them accessible to cheap circuits of circulation and consumption. The pleasure of this access ranges from global landmarks like Big Ben or let's say the Leaning Tower of Pisa at Eco Park to classy colonial neighborhoods like recreating the festive mood of Park Street on Christmas nights with Santa Claus cutouts and fairy lights decorating big stretches of the lake town throughout the entire winter season. What is really happening here? An exclusive experience of an inner city hotspot on a special night, that is Christmas in Park Street, is now becoming a retail commodity to be accessed by the masses at leisure in their free time, at cheap cost. That then is the unique gift of the populist regime, which effectively works as a message for the masses who can now enjoy a good that was strictly limited to the elites for long, that is, who used to be able to visit Park Street on a Christmas night. So this is the first message. The second message is more direct and immediately visual. It involves the constant repetition and amplification of the leader's face, along with images of local leaders, sometimes in smaller sizes, and related symbols and iconography that are mounted across these neighborhoods. The images of leaders advertising their successful projects and vision for a global branding of the state seamlessly blends with the iconography of the region's cultural and nationalist heritage, erasing the signs of any alternative political discourse from the landscape. In our case, erasing any sign of, let us say, the leftist discourse from the landscape. The result, in their, therefore, is a saturation of only one political idiom, that of the ruling party, and only one available leader really deserving to lead the people. This is underscored also by the sartorial styling as the leader is displayed as shorn of all signs of luxury and excess, embodying a simplicity, in our case, in her starched white cotton sari and rubber slippers, a didi who lives like the masses despite ruling the state for nearly a decade. This leads us to the third way of messaging, which basically combines the first two, to lock in a support for the regime. This involves a kind of psychological priming. It identifies two sets of elements that radically alters what behavioral economists, for instance, Nobel laureates like Thaler, would describe as the architecture of choice of an actor. This is done by arranging motivating factors and disincentives in such a manner that one is driven to only one kind of choice and blinded to other alternatives. Let me very briefly indicate how this takes place. On the one hand, therefore, there is the delivery of a new kind of public good in these neighborhoods, which alters the very manner in which we understand public good. In this case, such public good approximates the experience of consumption 
which is made available at heavily discounted rates to a population that cannot usually afford this experience at the authentic location. It carries the sense of redistributing the elements of a prosperous life among a wider section of people that used to be limited to the rich few in the urban society of old days. This redistribution that does not involve concrete goods and services but involves access to previously denied experiences is projected as the new kind of public good that has become possible by the initiative of a certain regime. The leader of this regime personally embodies the commitment to such a redistribution and the inclusion of poor people into the privileges of urban experience. Any rejection of this leader and the regime would therefore imply an end to this inclusive redistribution and a return of the elite control over good life in the big city. To prevent that, people must be voluntarily locked into keeping on supporting the regime. Now, as we can imagine, there can be several troubling consequences of this. Let me quickly flag two worrisome aspects. Firstly, there is a highly cosmetic nature of the change that is being wrought behind the apparently democratic implications of creating such spaces. The perennially festive face of these neighborhoods is not backed up with the development of better infrastructure, connectivity, and civic facilities like the inner city localities enjoy. They cannot attract major business houses or big private players to launch, say, public-private partnership projects with the potential of generating employment and disposable income for the local population, which will make jobs available to them. In fact, the organization of retail and small trade, as well as the minor projects of beautification, often involve a chain of petty corruption among the members of the local club, the party cadres, and the traders that they favor. The benefits of increasing footfall in the neighborhood is thus mostly appropriated by these limited pool of players who are often accused by the opposition and the media of taking cut money. There are very few signs so far to indicate that these neighborhoods will transform from the display of what we can describe as a notional prosperity to a much more substantive reality of well-being. While the former creates a range of aspirations, especially among the youth of the area, the real lack of opportunities may lead to frustration and resentment with grave consequences before long. Secondly, consider the political implications of the process of psychological priming. It involves various kinds of identification and collapsing of categories. It confuses a cosmetic beautification and the facilitation of petty consumption with a more substantive idea of development in popular perception. People can no longer distinguish a superficial public good from a more substantive public facility. This renders any effort for creating municipal facilities and public goods in a concrete sense practically pointless given the political cost besides the drain on exchequer. What is more problematic is the identification of a certain leader with the access to certain elements of good life among the previously excluded masses. Such a leader and regime will not only appear as the best choice for those who believe in the redistributive commitment of this leader, any competitor who counters these claims as hollow and is, is bound to be seen 
as cynic and part of the older elite clique who are unsettled by this democratic redistribution. Given the fragile and delicate nature of these benefits, such as the low-cost experience of synthetic recreation, it is easy to imagine that these will be gone the moment this particular leader and her regime is removed from power. Unlike a system of patronage politics where the client could seek benefits from several competing patrons in return of their support, this is a far more sinister arrangement. Hence, here the beneficiary is locked into a relation of permanent support for a particular leader and regime because he or she is unable to think of alternatives. Once such a political locking in takes place, the supporter is soon willing to go along with the excesses committed by the regime and actually welcomes centralization of power by the authority. Any criticism of this authority, any protest will begin to appear to the supporters as obstacles to a change for the better and the prospect of such a change will definitely appear as worthy of doing away with opposition altogether, effectively suspending democracy. In other words, the upshot of such psychological priming is the consolidation of support for authoritarian regimes. Paradoxically, this move to authoritarianism comes on the back of democratic principles of inclusion and redistribution. And this is where populism poses its biggest threat. It can make a cynic use of democracy from within to subvert its basic foundation. It is uncertain, however, if authoritarianism can deliver the prosperity it promises to the masses. The reality of poverty is never too far from the prosperous surface of these neoliberal neighborhoods. Let me now come briefly to the case studies and get a little bit into the historical trajectories of these case studies, give you a kind of empirical account of how these neoliberal neighborhoods came into being in these particular cases. So how did these geographies begin to take shape? This is a narrative waiting to be fully fleshed out and I'm only attempting something like a sketchy outline. but. The outlines appear fascinating to me, at the very least. What seems common to both Lake Town and Patuli is that these localities are intimately linked with the history of the partition and refugee influx in the city of Kolkata. Topographically, they were marshlands and water bodies located on the eastern fringe of the old city primarily used for farming and fishing before they underwent landfill and turned into tenements and settlements for the people who came in from what was East Pakistan and is now Bangladesh. These localities house, therefore, the history of post-colonial Kolkata, which used to be outside the city once upon a time and which struggled for long to be integrated with urban geography until the late 20th century. Let me go back to the slides for a moment. So here is an image of Sri Bhumi Lake Town as you can see and we can come back to this. I am more interested in showing you the transformation of Patuli. So this is a kind of contemporary image of Patuli. You can see what is called the floating market of Patuli. Um, <clears throat> it's an image easily available online and this is how modern Patuli looks like. Now. This image of a uh, floating market is very often uh, compared with uh, this other image of a floating market in Bangkok, 
and in fact several publications um published simultaneously both these images showing how patuli is on its way uh, to becoming bangkok of kolkata and so on which is you know a nod to the copy culture that i was speaking about now patuli developed in the 1990s as an extension of boishnav ghata and boishnav ghata stood at the periphery of south kolkata that stretched from jadavpur to goria mainly populated by refugee colonies that slowly turned into middle and upper middle class localities by the turn of the 21st century during the three decade long rule of the left front the organization of these localities was led by local clubs formed by refugees which housed libraries held cultural events organized annual religious festivals like the durga puja and functioned as hubs of socialization and focal points of political mobilization in the area highlighted by scholars like partho chatterjee as an important example in the theoretical formulation of political society it is these clubs that came to play an instrumental role in the changes that led to what i describe as neoliberal neighborhoods this transformation has been mapped with a wealth of detail in the case of lake town and sri bhumi by young scholars like shounita mukherjee mukherjee highlights the recent changes of urban landscape in the light of populist politics she describes tellingly how the lakes and marshy lowlands of patipukur area were slowly converted into the lake town neighborhood in the 1960s with a vip road coming up next to the locality connecting the city with domdom airport she traces the telling role of an older association or club gandhi seva sangho which was instrumental in i quote her giving the locality and its residents its social cohesiveness and the sense of a moral community now i was struck with this description because one can immediately find many parallels of the gandhi seva sangho in south kolkata refugee neighborhoods for instance in the boishakhi club in ganguli bagan or the jatra shuru sangho in boishnav ghata which also created this sense of a collective moral community among the refugee settlers of newly occupied areas in the mid 20th century the jatra shuru sangho for example began to organize an annual durga puja introducing a special five idol poncho durga feature that quickly became a crowd puller and gave the locality a new respectability in the early 1980s it also staged plays and musical programs craft fairs and cultural festivals sports and athletic events blood donation camps along with trainers who supervised daily physical activities and exercises for children besides housing a modest public library such activities reflected a sober mix of gandhian ethics of self organization and progressive values with socialist sentiments as the club members soon began to overlap with the local cadres of communist parties that led the regime from 1980s however these activities reflected a very different nature of neighborhood ethos which placed a premium on sobriety cultivated taste and distance from ostentatious displays of wealth this is in sharp contrast with today when a different set of activities that are managed by younger clubs have taken over these neighborhoods as they have undergone a new round of transformation in the turn of the century as the eastern metropolitan bypass started taking shape from the 1990s it led to taking over the marshlands and water bodies lying between the new highway and boishnav ghata and the landfill began to give rise to new neighborhood 
of Patuli. Initially developed as clusters of low income housing projects by the municipality, most of them were resold, most of them were resold and redeveloped as middle class residential housing projects by the municipality. Uh, middle class residential housing projects, uh, housing societies, excuse me, expanding into new localities and you can see, get a feel of these new localities in this image, giving rise to new clubs like the Patuli Central Club that played a central role in the current transformations that are visible today. This involved such clubs taking active part in the beautification drive of the area, which is what I was focusing upon, which included the embellishment of the embankment of the canal with fancy street lights, decorative tableaus, replicas of cartoon figures, along with fiberglass statuary of film stars, artists, cultural and nationalist icons. I wish I had image of this, but I don't. Some of you who have visited the locality would know, as well as organizing a series of craft and food fairs throughout the year including the hosting of a relatively grand scale annual Patuli Utshav. The layout of the residences as a consequence has also begun changing with condominiums becoming visible in the horizon. Clearly, the role of Patuli Central Club and the patronage of the powerful local councillor Bappaditya Dashgupta has become more instrumental in molding the neighborhood today than the Jatra Shuru Shangha past. Dashgupta is the key person in getting the municipality to develop a floating market on the Patuli Lake. As you can see, people from far and near come here every day during the day and at night to buy daily groceries, traveling on a wooden walkway, meandering through retailers, selling their wares, on teethered boats. Dashgupta has also made clever use of recycled scrap iron fabricated in a local factory for a local puja decoration under his patronage in order to create a mini replica model of the Howrah Bridge that is installed across another stretch of the lake, illuminated at night. All these drives at beautification seem to have successfully pitched the status of Patuli today into a coveted real estate destination for the new generation of upwardly mobile aspiring middle class professionals. At least that is how the advertisements would have it today. In a somewhat similar way, the role of Shabhumi Sporting Club has come to overshadow the Gandhi Sheva Shango in Mukherjee's narrative of Lake Town which found a new leader and patron in Shujit Bosch, a trusted deputy of Mamata Banerjee who has pushed the locality into limelight as a site of perennial festivities. Mukherjee has described how Lake Town now boasts of a children's park, a leisure park, prettified pedestrians walkways and decorative street lights with kiosks and stalls lined up along the canal, all emblazoned with I quote her, a blaze of blue and white illumination, unquote, which are the colors of the ruling party, including the buildings as you can see. Instead of the older set of welfare activities, the new Lake Town is hosting events like Rakhi Utshab, Ganesh Utshab and Freedom at Midnight, which has become a staged display of public charity. People flock to visit the Big Ben prototype installed on the VIP road, taking selfies in front of the Bisho Bangla logo and marveling at the latest Durga Puja pavilion, which is a spectacular palace from the latest blockbuster film, recalling the theme park aesthetics that I was talking about. In sum, the neighborhoods like Lake Town on the VIP road and Patuli on the Eastern Bypass look very much like indigenous fragments of Disneyland tailored for masses who want to consume the experience of citizenship in ways that are pleasing, 
and fleeting at the same time. Let me now come to the conclusion. The transformation of Lake Town is meant to illustrate what Mukherjee describes as a new populist politics centered on spectacles, spawning a culture of entertainment geared to an effective management of masses by aesthetic renovation of the civic sphere. It is an important insight that builds upon a fascinating argument made by the historian Tapoti Guhothakurta. Guhothakurta makes a larger case through what she describes as the festival mode of Mamata Banerjee's political governance and particularly the visual thrust of populism in Bengal, which uses Durga Puja as a template for an aesthetic overhaul of the entire city. However, Guho Thakurta points out that despite this city-wide drive for beautification, there are certain key zones on the outer ring of the city like Boishnam Ghata Patuli, Lake Town, Salt Lake and New Town Rajarhat that have been subjected to intense and cost initiative projects of the creation of popular art. I think these sites present us with an important possibility for further thought and analysis, especially to historians and political scientists. And this lecture has precisely tried to explore such a possibility with the case of Patuli. This possibility involves pushing in a direction that avoids doing three things. Juxtaposing development with beautification or making governance and festivities mutually exclusive or treating politics and consumption as antagonistic phenomena. I believe there are sufficient reasons to think that these oppositions do not hold good any longer, either in the case of governmental practice or even in the case of oppositional moves and maneuvers against the government. We know, for instance, the significance of spectacles, spectacular visuals and effective mobilization and emotional pitches in recent protest events. The point I therefore find interesting is to investigate how these two poles keep modifying each other today. What does the new aesthetic makeover do to the process of political mobilization? How does the content of governance change when politics seeks to deliver consumption? How do these strategies prepare a convenient setting for neoliberal policies and authoritarian regimes to stealthily subvert democracies, democracies from inside? In a sense, then, it takes us back to the problem of pulling together the different threads of populism that various scholars have been exploring in their recent works. I have tried to unravel one of these threads in this lecture primarily, namely, where does the ideological strand of populism intersect with that of governance? We try to address this in a limited manner in the site that I describe as neoliberal neighborhoods. In the process, I try to present a glimpse of the current thrust of urban development and its implications for larger democratic politics in India. Thank you. I'll stop there. Over to you, Audit. Thank you, sir. Thank you for such a wonderful talk. Now we can open the floor for questions. So the first question see. is in Bengali. Yes. It is by Sukhukas Vishta. Uh, I can see. Saying, Sir, act a prosno chilo. Adger dine kihabe Johnson ka politics se rupor atota prohab hale bivino anki ke. Prosno ta amar kache khub porishkar noy. Uni Johnson ka bolte ki bolte chai chen. Sheta arik to porishkar hole 
সুবিধে হতো কিন্তু আমরা এটা জানি এখন যে যদি জনসংখ্যা বলতে উনি পপুলেশন মিন করে থাকেন প্রাইমারিলি তাহলে পলিটিক্স যেভাবে করা হয় এবং পলিটিক্সকে আমরা যেভাবে বুঝে এসেছি সেটা চিন্তা করলে পলিটিক্সের স্পেশালি স্টেটের পার্সপেক্টিভে বা গভর্নেন্সের পার্সপেক্টিভে পলিটিক্সকে বোঝার ক্ষেত্রে এবং পলিটিক্সকে ভাবার ক্ষেত্রে একটা বড় বদল এসেছে আমরা বড় বড় এটা ভেবে হ্যালো ध्रुपदी भाव राजनीति भावा पलिटिक्स के भावा तत्वयन एक दिक्कत भेबे देखते गतुन तत्वयन आसोर का जिन এটা যদি একটা দিক হয় রাজনীতির তাহলে বিশেষ করে নিও লিবারাল রাজনীতির নিও লিবারাল রাষ্ট্র পরিচালনার ক্ষেত্রে যেটা গুরুত্বপূর্ণ হয়ে ওঠে যেটাকে উনি বলছেন গভর্নমেন্টালিটি সেক্ষেত্রে যেটা গুরুত্বপূর্ণ হয়ে ওঠে সেটা হচ্ছে এই পপুলেশনের ভূমিকা অর্থাৎ স্টেট সব সময় মানুষকে সিটিজেন হিসেবে দেখে না কখনো সিটিজেন হিসেবে ভাবে কখনো জন জনসংখ্যা বলতে উনি যেটা বলেছেন বা পপুলেশন হিসেবে দেখে এবং সেটা মাথায় রেখে স্টেটের ব্যবহার বা স্টেটের কার্যপ্রণালী বদলে যেতে থাকে স্টেট যখন নতুন কোনো পলিসি নেওয়ার চেষ্টা করে তখন পপুলেশনের কথা মাথায় ভেবে এই প্রণালীগুলো নেওয়ার চেষ্টা করে এখানে গভর্নমেন্টালিটির গুরুত্ব যেমন সেন্সাসে আমরা যেটা দেখতে পাই সেখানে জনসংখ্যা একটা খুব মুখ্য ভূমিকা বা পপুলেশন একটা খুব মুখ্য ভূমিকা পালন করে এবং এই সেন্সাসকে মাথায় রেখেই কিন্তু বিভিন্ন ধরনের পলিসি আন্ডারটেক করা হয় যেমন ধরা যাক সংরক্ষণের পলিসি যেমন বিশেষ অনুসূচিত জনজাতিকে কি ধরনের সুযোগ সুবিধা দেওয়া হবে বা কি ধরনের চাকরি তাদের জন্য সংরক্ষিত করা হবে বা ভারতবর্ষে কত শতকরা কত সংখ্যক মানুষ এখন চাষ আবাদে যুক্ত আছেন তাদের জন্য কিভাবে কিছু সরকারি পলিসি ভাবা যায় এই পলিসি নির্ধারণের পুরো জায়গাটাই কিন্তু পপুলেশনকে মাথায় রেখে আজকে করা হয় সুতরাং সেই জন্য পপুলেশন বিষয়টি আজকে অত্যন্ত গুরুত্বপূর্ণ আশা করি এই মানে এটাই উনি জানতে চাইছিলেন নয়তো আবার প্রশ্নটা করতে পারেন I have a single inquiry. What do you think about the populist politics and new way of data, data interpretation? More specifically, I am talking about the Indian Political Action Committee. Uh, thank you, Jodip, for this question. Uh, I have no idea what you are speaking about. Absolutely no idea. I know very little about Indian Political Action Committee and uh, even less about the relationship between data interpretation and uh, populist politics. And uh, I have no clue as to what is its connection with what I'm talking about today, which has to do with urbanization. If you would like to clarify, I would be happy to learn. Can we move on to the next question? Yes. It is very How populism still. can affect politics in future? Rakesh Teh. আমি পড়তে পারছি আর কি প্রশ্নগুলো স্ক্রিনে পপুলিজম ইজ অলরেডি এফেক্টিং পলিটিক্স নাও ভেরি ভেরি স্ট্রংলি অ্যান্ড দিস ইজ ওয়াই অল অফ আস আর ট্রাইং টু থিঙ্ক অ্যাবাউট পপুলিজম ইন ভেরিয়াস কাইন্ডস অফ ওয়েজ তো ইন্টারেস্টিং থিং ইজ ইফ ইউ আস্ক মি দেয়ার আর মেনি হু উড থিঙ্ক দ্যাট পপুলিজম হ্যাজ ভেরি প্রোগ্রেসিভ পোটেন্সিয়ালস দেয়ার ক্যান বি populist politics of the progressive variety some would even say of the leftist variety one of the theories that i talked about ernesto laclau uh, is basically trying to make a case for a left wing populism as opposed to right wing populism which is what we are getting to see uh, increasingly in this country but if you ask me i am not so very hopeful about uh, the possibility of a left wing populism or a progressive populist politics to my mind uh, the most important potential that we need to worry about or we need to think about with regard to populism 
and politics in the future is the way in which populism can lead to authoritarianism support for authoritarian regimes uh, and that to uh, by playing by democratic rules large and uh, by and large so that is the more worrying aspect uh, that concerns me that uh, in the future in the not too distant future i think populism will increasingly push us uh, within democratic frames more and more towards authoritarian regimes which will then sort of subvert and sabotage democracy from within well i think you know we are very much uh, on that road already if i am not gravely mistaken yes adit any other question so the next question Anand is from Shah. Shah. Hmm. i cannot make sense of this question very clearly do you think that this is politics especially in india under threat despite other political party always shown a face of their agenda to the people is people misled i cannot make sense of this uh, question very well nanandjay shah can you kindly rephrase it uh, write it again in english or bangla mm, i can then take it up i cannot make sense of the question as it is right now audit can you make sense of the question then i would be happy to take it up or let me move on to ronak bhattacharjee's question yes sir will the mobilization of public support through the mode of clubs and recreational centers lead to their institutionalization and will the bjp adopt such a process to garner votes in the kolkata area uh, ronak bhattacharjee i think this is a very very interesting and important question i do think that uh, clubs have been playing an extremely important role in political mobilization they have done so since very very long since the swadeshi era i should think i mean much of the activities of onushilan samiti jugantar samiti were based in various kinds of uh, clubs of of those period and then later on after independence one had seen congress early congress politics used to be very strongly based in the mobilization of local clubs uh, then communist politics or left politics also took over the clubs and sort of uh, made it overlap with the local committees in some sense and i am sure that uh, this is what the bjp will very strongly uh, try to do uh in the days to come unless they're doing it already because this actually opens up uh, the key to mobilize people through various kinds of social initiatives so you cannot shut them down as sort of political uh, giving them political labels or political tags clubs are extremely important they have played extremely important role in community life of various areas and localities especially in the urban areas and i do think that they will continue to play an important role they already have a certain institutional status and i think we are going to see uh, their strengthening in the days to come yes shonita i would like to ask both with reference to lake town and patuli what is the imagination of the public and what are the notions of public good and popular taste that is driving this investment in politics of festivities and beautification okay shonita so i think thank you and that is very very pointed question and uh, you would be clued in uh, as you must have followed i refer to you several times to your work <clears throat> which i had had the good fortune of examining so there is i think much to be thought about the manner in which the idea of public public good popular taste all these are undergoing rapid transformations and to begin with for instance i try to spell out in the paper uh, although in a very limited manner i what i try to do is um, 
how the notion of public good is undergoing a change now with regard to urban governance for instance we were more accustomed to thinking about public good in terms of um, let us say better roads uh, better sewage facilities uh, better uh, infrastructure better you know drinking water provisions so on and so forth okay these were the ideas of public good better municipality services um, these were the standard uh, notions uh, standard sort of things we used to think with regard to public goods when we used to think about city life urban life now what i find interesting is that the idea of public good is very fast is shifting very fast from these kinds of concepts these kind of uh, notions in some sense and moving to something like you know the access to something like leisure the access to something like recreation you know just the chance of being able to sit by you know the lake for a couple of hours taking selfies uh, having you know sort of petty consumption snacking with friends maybe having small parties you know doing small videos of each other uploading them on social media garnering likes these have moved into the idea of public good a very different idea of consumption a different uh, idea of consumption which has uh, links with celebration partying festivity chilling out having a cool time those kinds of things of course you know we have a particular age profile uh, in consideration here but increasingly i because these never used to be within uh, uh, the sense of you know public good at large um these have now become uh, the idea of public good and the interesting thing is that these are things that do not require um infrastructure from the municipality that can be provided by let us say a private stall by a private uh, petty trader uh, by you know the owner of a petty restaurant a small restaurant who can you know create provisions for sitting by the lake side so on and so forth and the great thing about that is that you know you go to the lake side you sit for an hour you have a cup of tea you maybe you have a little bit of snacks you chat with your friends you like the experience and you feel grateful to the regime you feel that you know i have enjoyed something like a public good so then there is a huge displacement of the idea of public good which makes the older kinds of public goods rarer and rarer because providing those kind of public goods involve real cost to be borne by the government which now let us say something like a local councillor is not going to undertake if the public is uh, happy and satisfied with this new kind of public good okay so that's uh, the first thing the second thing is also in terms of popular taste once again there is a massification there is a move away from what used to be more dominated to by high culture by educated uh, middle class upper middle class people their tastes and the sense of what bourdieu would call distinction okay which was very different from cheap tacky vulgar you know uh, kind of let us say um, b grade bollywood movies kind of a thing now the idea of popular taste the rubric of popular taste is coming to include more and more this popular um tacky uh, i shouldn't have said popular this precisely those things that used to be identified with low culture at a earlier point of time and therefore there is a sort of declassing of popular taste in some sense a new set of actors are coming to define what we understand by popular taste okay and that i think is is a very significant shift that has taken place and one should have will need to think through the ramifications of that public i'll just keep myself limited to talking about the sense of public in terms of the public space and 
there is a lot that one can actually think there but one important uh, phenomena having to do with that is a new kind of um, conversation happening or uh, to borrow an older term dialectic happening between public and private a very very different set of activities used to be understood as belonging to the public at an earlier point of time and a certain set of activities were relegated to what we used to think as the private space and this distinction has begun collapsing i think uh, perhaps there is a new set of activities that have become private but uh, with uh, the new these new kinds of uh, spaces that have come up the new kind of sites that have come up the kind of activities that they allow and the coming in of of course the new sort of devices smartphones screens so on and so forth a completely new kind of relationship is coming to be constituted between different kind of subjects um, between themselves and which is redefining the idea of public as in public space as we used to understand it at a certain point of time so this is much more of a this is much more of a public space which takes in uh, which sort of uh, big chunks of what used to belong to the private at one point of time and redefines itself in radically kind of new ways which would be interesting to map okay i can see another question audit should i go ahead that the next question is by nilakantha pal yeah, i can i can i can read it it's on the screen whether this kind of populist politics and its project of creating neoliberal neighborhood i suppose facing any kind of resistance from various marginal sectors if yes what are the forms of resistance once again a very very pertinent and important question uh, very very important question nil kontho thank you for that question um <clears throat> i am actually uh, you know i must admit that uh, i will end up disappointing you because to be frank and honest i don't really see um so far too many signs of resistance in some sense you know one can always dig up uh, different kinds of um, publics being created different kind of assemblies of bodies being created different kind of uh conglomerations of sites coming up for instance let us say the agitation against uh, uh citizenship amendment act the kind of public assembly that we uh, had got some good fortune to witness there or you know what happened with the hok color of movement uh, in jadavpur university or later on in you know certain other university spaces and you know in various kinds of social movements they do sort of bring up different kinds of imaginations of public spaces of urban spaces of meeting points of uh, subjects meeting points of actors which are you know perhaps much more politically meaningful politically much more welcome from the democratic perspective from a progressive perspective but in terms of you know the creation of new kinds of neighborhoods designing new kinds of spaces urban spaces i don't i don't think that um, i don't find uh, you know sort of serious substantial signs of any resistance at that level what i find is really sort of variations of uh, these kind of uh, spaces coming up um, whether it is a sabarmati waterfront in ahmedabad or you know what is happening to lucknow or prayagraj or what is happening to you know what i just tried to describe these spaces by the way are not entirely homogeneous so when i'm saying that they are uh, neoliberal neighborhoods it does not mean that they are merely spawning neoliberalism let me give you an example you know one of the things that i said in passing is that couple of things one is that what i one of the things that i like about these kind of sites and neighborhoods is that people can congregate there people who are from different classes people who are from different religions people who are from different caste backgrounds 
this is not something that I am very you know familiar with with regard to the older kind of public spaces uh, that I have seen in the city. So there is in that sense, you know, how much ever I hate to admit a serious democratic potential in terms of what these spaces have come to provide. Now, these people are coming over to these spaces in order to primarily consume, you know, that is where perhaps there lies a sort of um, negative implication of these kind of spaces. But they are also sites with a lot of potential where various things can happen apart from the aspect of consumption, uh, apart from the aspect of, you know, support being mobilized for authoritarian regimes. Who knows? You know, politics is never a closed book. You know, for the time being, I have just kind of mapped out these kinds of sites and tried to indicate the, well, the more, let us say, what are some possibilities uh, at this point? Yes, Audit. Thank you, sir. sir there are uh, eight to nine questions, questions uh, okay. in the comment section. Would you okay. like to take more? Um, how much time do we have left with us? It is up to you. Uh, it's up to me. Okay. Yes. Uh, can I can I get, can I look at the questions all together? Can you put them on the chat? I could yes. I could then see if I could club some of them together and yeah. Yes. If I could club some of them together, then it would be perhaps easier to feel some of them. Okay. I can see one. Do I, I don't see the name. Um Oh, I want oh, to okay, know. Sir. I, sir, I will tell the name. Just one second. Yeah. So the first question that I posted I... in the chat is by yeah. uh, is by Trisha Mondol. Is populist politics interrelated with identity based politics? Right? That is the question you have in mind. Trisha Mondol. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, yes. I think that you know uh, this is absolutely spot on. Um, though not all populist politics has to do with identity politics, but much of identity politics is clued into populist politics. I mean, right now it's very difficult to kind of bracket uh, one, and one shouldn't be saying that populist politics is equal to identity politics because um, there is uh, there are uh, quite a few signs to suggest that let's say traditional left-wing politics or traditional progressive sort of politics is also uh, taking on idioms that belong to populist politics okay for instance the use of spectacles and you know emotional sort of pitches and so on and so forth but uh, yes um, much a lot of identity politics identity based politics especially those that involve mass mobilization is geared to uh, populist politics in one way or the other at this point of time, I should think. Okay. So the next question is just as, okay, just as there is a promise of experiencing the good life, there seems to be a constant communication to the masses of some elites now feeling threatened about the loss of the good life they have enjoyed and taken for granted. That seems to bolster the narrative of not just being promised something, but as you pointed out, the narrative of redistribution. Well, yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, I would I would tend to agree with that, and and this is what actually works in favor of uh, the populist kind of moves on the part of the government, that the government can always project that look when I create these kind of neighborhoods or when I create these kind of sites for you, I am making accessible certain goods to you that used to be previously uh, only limited to the elites. And therefore, you know, the elites are going to criticize this because, you know, this used to be their monopoly. And, you know, I'm now giving you, the masses, access to this good life. Okay. Having said that, having said that, there are two very important things to keep in mind. One is that 
what the masses are experiencing in terms of good life is more often than not a certain kind of superficial um, level of those goods which are experienced in the good life that are let us say enjoyed by the elites okay there is a certain uh, replica copy simulated sort of uh, dimension of the goods that are being accessible to the masses in terms of these what these neoliberal neighborhoods are coming to offer to the masses so there is always a, a certain kind of reserved category for the authentic you know for instance only the rich people can afford let's say i mean i'm using the word rich in a sort of loose sense but only let us say the affluent middle class or well off at least middle class people can afford to go and you know take a picture in front of the real eiffel tower or the real big ben or the real pyramid of giza giza um the masses can only afford to visit the eco park and take their selfies against you know smaller scale replicas of of these monuments so there is that you know these experiences are at one remove from the authentic which continue to belong to the elite at some level and it is that superficiality that i find you know important to uh, grasp and you know critique okay so let me move on to the next question this is from shruti dubey yeah okay okay great to what extent if at all can we say that paradoxically there is something intrinsic to modern democracies that regularly find themselves in situations that prioritize populism that end up being detrimental to substantive democracy okay this is quite a complicated question i think <clears throat> since i know uh, the scholar who's kind of addressed this question uh, she's probably also um, got a little tied up in in phrasing the question if i can make sense of it i think what i'm being asked is is there something intrinsic to democracies that they keep on that they have a tendency of prioritizing moves that are fundamentally populist which then become detrimental to the substantial core of democracy in other words is there is a mechanism built within democracy that comes to threaten democracy well um shruti there are uh, scholars and theorists who would tend to agree with you on this account um there are uh, and and you know that you know a colleague of mine for instance um, dr amir ali is very much persuaded that uh, this is what is actually we are witnessing at this point of time and there are um, a couple of scholars uh, uh, american scholars who have written about a phenomena called democide which is basically a phenomena of democracies you know committing suicides um, because uh, their argument is and i think it kind of ties in with the question that you're asking their argument is that democracies have a mechanism whereby they you know sort of side with more and more inclusion they side with they tend to side more and more with the masses and uh, this sort of inclusion of the masses uh, begin to sort of disrupt the qualitative core of democracy in one way or the other which begins to subvert democracy now i think there is some truth to this there is some truth to this um but i would qualify it because i think that uh, this has to do in some sense with uh, fundamentally electoral democracies and the manner in which numbers come to play a big role in electoral democracies what i think really is when i am taking populism to task when i am critiquing populism i don't think that that populism is actually serving the interest of the masses i think that populism is basically serving the interest very much of a 
you know tiny circumscribed elite represented by an individual supreme leader kind of a figure in the who is what he is doing is that he is managing to do it successfully in the name of masses you know who is managing to kind of successfully parade it as being done in the interests of the masses but fundamentally it is an elite capture one elite capture that is being sort of replaced by another elite capture let us see and i don't think that it seriously substantively it represents the sort of taking of power of the people or the masses okay we need to be very careful about the use of that category of the people or the masses in that sense or the category of demos in that sense and therefore i think that democracy also has the possibility of very substantive serious meaningful inclusion that can contest you know this kind of subversions at the same time but it would require that at least a certain range of political forces in democracy in my opinion will have to begin to think outside of the populist modality of politics you know one of the troubles that i find with you know i was trying to explain my unhappiness with with populism as such with scholarship on populism is the line of scholarship that begins from ernest or laclau who pitches left wing populism against right wing populism and there is a great sort of strength and power to that sort of an argument i know having said which i am not very convinced with that kind of an argument i don't think that all shades of progressive politics or all shades of radical pro politics should take the path of populist politics i think that populist politics is a sort of trajectory that is sort of full of um, possibilities of superficial risky moves that are subversive for democracy that are subversive for progressive radical democratic kind of causes and there is a possibility of getting carried away by the momentum in populist politics of being you know of giving up of throwing away rational deliberations considered judgments so on and so forth which must have a serious weight in political decision making by the people at large and that is where i would i uh, like to think of democracy in a substantial sense where deliberation where rational judgments where patient dialogues have a very very serious and important role which is precisely what populism is not to my mind thank you okay, sir okay adit thank you thank you, yeah. thank you once again for such an engaging talk thank you uh, we have come to an end uh, thank you once again for joining us uh, thank you the one thanks from the team voyages into the past which is to our host to our viewers who have joined us engaged in such a wonderful conversation with dr dash gupta stay tuned in a, to our page our next lecture is by dr koushik bondwadhar the lecture is titled politics Uh, contemporary politics, contemporary history, the Indian context. Thank you. Thank you. So, how do I leave audit? Ah, I can I can see a button. Thank you, thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed. Thank you, sir.